Good morning. This is very exciting to me. I, I really am excited to talk about uh, discipleship. It's uh, especially multiplication. It's uh, an issue of my heart. There's only one more thing that excites me more, and that's relationship with Jesus. And uh, so I'll, I'll try to cover three areas. And um, one, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak on the uh, method that, uh, that Jesus used, uh, how we see multiplication in, in uh, his ministry. Then I'll talk about the multiplication in the ideal world and uh, then uh, multiplication in the, in the real world. And I hope that uh, by the end, the end, we will have time for personal reflection and um, some action steps that the Lord is leading us to. Um, I'm involved with a ministry called Integrity Life, um, together with my colleagues Katka and Gabi, who are here. And uh, we have been uh, serving at the university, um, reaching out to university students. And uh, discipleship is a very natural next step after they become Christians. And multiplication is the key for the ministry to continue on. Um, let, me, let me come to the first uh, topic, and, and that is uh, Jesus' model of multiplication. And I know many things that I will be talking about, you have already talked about at this. Uh, so let me just summarize them briefly, and, and then we will have question time, so, so we will see uh, which ones are more important. Uh, we can see very clearly in uh, Jesus' earthly ministry that he spent time with the multitudes, but right at the beginning of his ministry, he chose several. And the, the closer the time of his departure uh, from this earth and being with his father, the less time he spent with the multitudes and the more time he spent with the few. So he spent more and more time with less and less people. He, um, um, once, um, sometime I, I have seen this um, very simple um, diagram. It was like the circles. Here was the 500. We read about 500 disciples in um, 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to 500 brothers. So there must have been about 500 people around him. And, and then uh, we read about 70 whom uh, he sent to uh, witness to share the good news. And then, of course, we, we read about 12 that he, that he chose, that he called to be his disciples. And then we, we hear about three, Peter, James, and John, who were even closer to him, who were present at some special moments in his life and ministry. So only those three were, for example, present uh, when he raised up the Jairus' daughter, and at the Mount of Transfigur Transfiguration, and at the Gethsemane. So he was, and he was focused, his focus was like you see these circles. He was focusing on three and then 12, and then it, it went on. Let me give you a small, um, story from, from my ministry. I became a Christian in 1982. And at about, maybe about a year or two after I became a Christian, uh, we, had a, we were a really, really small group. It was no more than five of us, university students in the city of Brno, communist Czechoslovakia. 
And there was a Bible teacher that we have known who came to encourage us as, as our small group. And I remember up to, up to this day what he was talking about. He was talking on the passage when Jesus, after his resurrection, he appeared uh, to uh, the two disciples that were walking from Jerusalem down to Emmaus, the small village. And his point was, it was a small place, and they even were not there. So he met them in the middle of nowhere, two people that were not significant. We don't even know their names. They were not really important. They were not significant. And his point was this. God is not going to use big groups of people. He is going to use small groups and individuals. And at that moment, I knew it is true. And it really, really touched my heart. And I said to myself, okay, it's no problem. We are only a group of five. That is not the issue. Well, uh, later I, 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 I heard this, the same man say something like, uh, like this about his uh, first experience with, with us. He said, I came to Brno to this, to this group of, little group of uh, five Christians, and they tried to sing Christian songs. It was depressing. <laughs> and, they, and their main leader, he couldn't find the book of Ephesians in the Bible. He meant me. <laughs> five or ten years later, the same person was crying when we was hearing the, the singing of our group. It touched so much his heart. And a few years later, this group of five grew into 100. In 10 years, it was, it was a more than 100 of disciples of Christ. And, and we knew that God can do uh, anything. He is not limited with the numbers. What he is limited with is our availability. It's our heart. And so um, let me ask you a question. I think we live in a culture where you know, the, the message is, the more is better, right? The bigger is better. Um, how does it influence the way we are thinking about ministry? Many times you meet a person and uh, what church do you go to? How big is your church? <laughs> we are really interested in that. And I'm not saying that big is, it's, 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 it's necessarily bad. I'm just saying that we are really thinking in these terms. And I think that uh, God, is, God is not so much interested in big numbers. He's interested in, in quality, as you have discussed before. Okay. Um, E.M. Bounds said, men's are... Men are God's method. His method are people, are men. So Jesus' mandate was to make disciples. And he has done it by, uh, by meeting their spiritual needs. And he was challenging them to the next level. A very helpful author um, and, um, and disciple maker, Dan Spader, uh, he said something like this. Jesus balanced his efforts to win the lost, to build believers, and to equip a few workers. Jesus' disciple making strategy follows four basic challenges. So he noticed, Spader noticed, uh, when he studied the Gospels chronologically, 
that the first uh, challenge, simple challenge to the disciples was come and see. Come and see. We read it John 1.39. And then he challenged them to the, to the higher level, to the next level of commitment, and, and that was follow me. That's John 1.43. And then there is a next level of commitment. Follow me, and I will make you the fishers of man. Matthew 4.19. And the final call was... Go and bear fruit. John 15, 16, and other passages. So we see that he was moving them and where it ends. The, the goal is reproduction. The goal was multiplication. The goal was um, to bear fruit. He clearly expected them to bear fruit. He said in John 15, 5, that he's the wine and the, we disciples are his, the branches. And he said, whoever abides in me will bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And, and then in uh, Matthew 13, he put another parable of the uh, mustard seed, uh, and then in John 17, uh, in his um, high priestly prayer, Jesus prays, he says, I do not ask for this only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they will be all, all be one, just as you in me and I in you. So he's, he fully expected his disciples to multiply, to be fruitful, to be bringing others to faith, to, uh, to faith in Jesus. He expected that others will believe through them. And then he sums it all up in uh, the, the verse that all of us know and all of us probably memorized, and that is the Great Commission. It's in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And uh, we'll spend a little time on that. Um, just please find it in your Bibles. And, um, and there are, of course, different translations. But the one I have, English Standard, is this. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, let's first notice the context. Um, and you probably you have probably um, known this, but let me let me just repeat it. Uh, he reminds the the five disciples three times before about the meeting in Galilee. Uh, the first place it's Matthew twenty six thirty one when. When Jesus, is saying to them, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. That was before his crucifixion. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And verse 32, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. He announced them, I'll be in, in the Galilee before you, meaning I expect that you will be following me there. And then in um, 28, Matthew 28, 7, 
he reminds them again, saying, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. The angel says to the women, uh, you, the, the, tell, go tell disciples, you got to go to Galilee. There you will meet Jesus. And then, a few verses after that, uh, verse 10, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. What kind of meeting was there? That he was making really sure that they will not miss it. Well, he gave the Great Commission. Um, so, the main controlling verb in the Great Commission is make disciples, make disciples. The other verbs in the verse are the participles, meaning that they are defining the, the way how it should be done. And there is a, if you notice, there is a built-in reproduction also in that, because he says, uh, they should be they should be teaching the, the other disciples everything I have commanded you. What one of the things that he had commanded them was to go and make disciples. They should be expecting the disciples to do the same, to be making other disciples who in turn will be making the next generation of disciples. Also notice that there is a, there is a relationship that is, that is really important here. It says, and behold, I am with you always. Uh, why is Jesus, I was thinking, why was Jesus saying this? Because he said also, I'll send the Holy Spirit and he'll be with you always. Well, um, I think the reason is that in going and making disciples, there will be a special presence of Jesus if we do that and if we obey that. And relationship with him is the most important thing in disciple making. Also notice that it is not a recommendation, <laughs> it's a command. Go make disciples. Robert Coleman, uh, in his book Master Plan of Evangelism, which was written in 1963, I remember that because I was born that year, um, <laughs> He, he says these prophetic words. The, the command to go and make disciples is the least obeyed command in the Bible. When I look at the church, it is the most neglected or disobeyed command that I see, unfortunately. Okay, let's, let's have some, some discussion. Do you think that every believer should be a disciple of Christ? Sure you do. <laughs> Is that right? Do you think that all of the uh, believers should be disciple makers? Yeah. Then, okay, now uh, a question that requires a little more thinking. What is the difference between disciple and disciple maker? What are some of the things that are different? 
for disciple and disciple maker. And so uh, we see Jesus doing it, and then we see the, the disciples obeying him. Uh, in the book of Acts, we read that this simple man, <clears throat> God used them to turn the world upside down. <clears throat> and uh, they really obeyed the, the principles that Jesus taught them. Okay, let's uh, spend a little time uh, about talking about the multiplication in the ideal world. Uh, we see, we see the, 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 and the, and the purpose is to see the potential, okay, of the, of the method, right? So, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure maybe some of you have heard um, the story, it's a legend, of a, <clears throat> of a father who's got two sons, and he told them, you know, you can choose. I can give you one dollar a week, and I will be giving it to you for one year. So you can choose this, or I can give you one cent the first week, the two cents the next week, the four cents the next, and eight and 16 and so on. And I'll be doing it for one year this way. Which one you choose? So the one son, he chose one dollar. It seemed to be fine. And so he ended up having $52 in the end of the year. The second was more clever, and so he chose one cent. You know, you know uh, by the end of the year, he got enough money to live comfortable life for the rest of his life. Actually, uh, you know, he got $22.5 trillion. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, I know everything's relative, but <laughs> that, that, should, that should go, you know. Um, another uh, illustration is, um, uh, again, very classic. You have the chessboard, right? And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, you put one grain of, uh, of wheat, for example, to, uh, to the first square, and there is 64, right? So the second, you, you put two, third, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. Um, and um, supposedly this was a, a the, 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 the one who invented the game, the, the chess, uh, was given this, um, uh, was, um, could ask for a reward. And so he asked this reward, okay, to the, to the ruler, to the king. And you know how much grain he would have uh, at the 64th square? Um, quite enough, because it would cover the, um, the whole subcontinent of India to the, uh, like 50 feet. So it's 15 meters, to the height of the 15 meters. Well, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a geometrical uh, uh, multiplication. Um, and, and the world knows this. Um, the many businesses use it. The multi-level marketing companies uh, are very much aware of this principle, and uh, some of them are using it, and some of them are misusing it. And um, uh, I think you could you could come up with the examples. Now, uh, let me give you uh, an example from um, um, an area that, that, is, that we are really concerned about, that, that, is, that is the um, disciple making. And I, again, you read it in, in different, um, different versions of it, in different literature, and it's, the purpose is to realize the potential. So the addition seems to be uh, a, a good method very effective method. Let's say there is a, I am a gifted evangelist, okay, and I am um, uh, able to speak with 1,000 people every day for the whole year. 
and fantastic uh, 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 results of my wonderful ministry would be that all of them would become Christians, okay? Then how long, how, how many years it would take me to, uh, to, be, to share, to evangelize the world? Uh, I don't think um, uh, I would be able to make it because it would take something like 15,000 years. Well, uh, then let's talk about a little more realistic scenario. I'll be speaking about Jesus with my friends in the environment that the Lord has put me into. And let's say that three of the unbelievers uh, will become Christians, will uh, uh, begin to follow Jesus, and I will uh, decide to, to spend time with them. Uh, and they will want, they will be, um, they will decide to, to become Jesus' disciples and grow in their faith. I'll be working with the three of them for two years. Uh, I'll be teaching them, helping them, I'll be loving them. Uh, I'm making sure that they will gradually become more and more independent. I'll be taking them with you, whatever other ministry I do. Uh, I will bring them to the fellowship with other believers and uh, I will uh, be a friend for them. And I will help them to do the same with others. You know, the first year there will be three people, three disciples. The second year there will be still three disciples. Then the next year, they will start multiplying, and it would be nine of them. And uh, after, after two years, there will be 27 of them. After 11 years, there, there will be 700 of them. After 15 years, there will be 6,000 of them. After 23 years, it will be half a million. And uh, after 33 years, it will be 130 million of them. And after one generation, 40 years, and I think this is a perfect example. It must be inspired because it's one generation, okay? You evangelize the whole world. Uh, there will be uh, over 10 billion of people. Now, uh, of course, this is the ideal, right? And we all know it's not working like that. Uh, but let me let us draw some some little conclusions out of this out of this uh, thing. Okay. Number one, Jesus gave us this multiplication as his method, as his marching orders. And the potential is that we can reach the world in one generation. Because the beauty of it is that I am not on my own, okay? There are more disciples today in the world. And, uh, but what, what happens very often is that we want to make it better. We want to improve Jesus' method, okay? So we do, we do it our way, not his way. How can we improve Jesus? Well, then the other, the other, other observation is that the key is the quality. It really, it really is important who you work with at the beginning. And then uh, they need to be faithful, right? Faithfulness is another word, another key that, uh, that is a big factor in the success of the, uh, of the uh, multiplication process. Another thing is that it's quite slow at the beginning. And we are not patient by nature. We want to see big results immediately. And 
You know, even in this, in this theoretical um, uh, case, it took, it took two years to build the three, right? And so you don't see big things at the beginning, but we've got to stick with it. We've got to be patient. Uh, another thing, what excites me greatly is that through uh, this simple method of making disciples that make other disciples, I can become part of something that's much bigger than me. Something that really has impact and makes a difference. So whatever else I do, and I'm not saying that I can't do anything else. Of course we need to do other things. But whatever other things we do, meaning we can be great engineers and doctors and uh, teachers, we can be uh, good workers, but it would be very, very sad if it would be all we do. Whatever else we do, we've got to make sure not to neglect into the lives of a few, helping them to become multiplying disciples. And it doesn't work mechanically, like, like you know, mathematics. There is spiritual and supernatural aspect and principle behind it. And it means also I am not in control. It means that I am not the one who is producing the growth. Neither myself, my own growth or the growth of the disciples. We read clearly that God is causing the growth. We are only watering. We are only tending. Um, and then the success is measured by multiplication and nothing else. And, um, and then another aspect there is that it's so rewarding uh, to be involved in somebody else's life and see what God is doing. What great miracles, great things he's doing in working uh, in his or her life. And I can be a small, small part of it. God can do it without me. But he chose to use me. And, and that's a blown mind thing. Um, mind blowing. <laughs> uh, Dawson Trotman, the founder of the Navigators, said this, activity is no substitute for production, and production is no substitute for reproduction. Very true and wise words. Let me, let me finish with uh, a simple action plan, or actually with, um, with three simple things, what it takes, what it would take to start making disciple making disciples. And then we go to small groups and uh, have some time of personal application. Um, what does it take? Number one, it's very simple. I must be available to God. I must be convinced that disciple making and multiplication is the best thing I can do in my life to serve others, to be, to be the uh, the, 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 the obedient uh, follower of Jesus Christ. So it takes conviction and it takes decision. It's still the first one. I need to decide, Lord, here I am. I am available. Use me. Number two, I must be willing to pay the price. There is no reproduction without sacrifice. Everyone who has ever been a parent knows that. 
And Jesus modeled that. He, it cost him his life. He, he sacrificed his life. And he says that the grain, unless it dies, will not bring any fruit, any, any crops. We need to die. We need to die to ourselves. Dying to self. That's not easy. That's a big price to pay. And Jesus uh, is saying in the, in the Luke's Gospel, two parables, uh, maybe more, but I, I'm thinking of two, of the builder who needs to think first if he's got enough to finish the building, and then the king or the general who needs to think first before going into the war. And so we've got to pay the price. And the price is not little, but let's remember, not paying the price is more costly than paying it.